of the game here. Snake versus EDG, and EDG just looks so good. We used freight trains when talking about League of Legends. It wasn't just the Chinese freight train. It was the EDG freight train running all over Snake, returning the receipt after their loss in Week 2. The first game, it was as one-sided as can be, but we're already well into the champion yeah, side for Game 2. Yeah, we're smashing through the draft right now. So EDG going to swap over to the blue side. Snake on the red. We have Zareth, Izzy, and Kalista, the same three bands, I believe, from... Uh, from yep. EDG in game one. And Vega gonna be mixed in here. Nidalee and LeBlanc actually snake spans with a Rek'Sai already first feet again for Black Lolly. He apparently had to name change between games. Yep, no, no longer Fire Lolly. Wants to match the Tencent production and come through with Fire Lolly, with Black Lolly. I like it. Okay, at least now we know his name. And uh, the pick's coming through. Something a little bit different though. They're considering between options, but very supporty. Hmm, I wonder if this is going to be a certain Juggermore. Yeah, this might be. Uh, let's protect the Crystal Comp here. Ellie going to go back on Johnny, his favorite support, it seems like. And Lulu can go almost anywhere. We've seen Bucker play it. I'm sure Flandre can play it. So uh, we'll see where that goes. But as you said, two big supports here. Some very strong champions coming through the picks. I like the ban on the Vega. Mako made them regret that decision and was just everywhere. I mean, the Talisman, Boots of Moby, Distortions, and just a QSS, just in case there were any cheeky stuns coming his way. The Event Horizon wrecked Snake. So probably smart respect man coming through from them. Yeah, and actually Cassidy and Lissandra have both been left open. And it seems like someone on EDD is going to get the Cassidy because they are going to lock it in here. They do pick it and they pick the Annie there as well. So a very powerful champion going over to EDG. I do love the fact that even with so many strong picks being available, they don't feel pressured to lock in or blind pick either their top and mid. They're leaving their options open. They've got the very flexible cast along with the, the balance. You know, I mean, Koro on that, uh, picking through the uh, the Rek'Sai. Rek'Sai's strong in any comp, whether it's early pressure or in the late game, has so many different options. And look, Annie, we've seen her in multiple lanes in the LPL. Very flexible with first three picks. And it looks like Crystal kind of abandoning the uh, hyper carry hype train. Maybe not. He's considering his options. Yeah, there's no way here, especially if they're gonna be picking Nunu there as well. Wow. Snake, you mentioned Juggamore already. Snake have completely shown their hand here in this draft. Nunu and Cogmore, their third and fourth picks. I mean, there's a Juggamore and there's like literally protect <laughs> the Cogmore. Like there's, there's no semblance of any other strategy. There's no way to change this comp with the last pick. This is all in on building up Crystal. They've already showed they have great proficiency on Juggamore. Of course, it makes sense. This has always been their identity. They've always been about leveling up Crystal and ha having him carry. And you can't really level much, much more than this. But with the picks that have come through, you can see Pawn. He wants to return to the Twisted Fate. With those summoners, I think it's going to be locked in. Best way to deal with a Juggermore, make sure the game never goes late and nobody overtakes a game like Twisted Fate. Yeah, especially in the hands of a player like Pawn here. And Deft, still not getting a Corky Man. He's going to take it away again here. And EDG have a... EDG to a T comp, I have to say. This just suits their style so well. I'm going to be very interested by the early rotations, though, Page Jam, specifically because Corky versus Cogmore is a danger matchup for, Cork for, Co for Corky. He can definitely be harassed in this lane. Biocane Barrage ensures that positive trades come through for Crystal, even before level 6 getting the extra burst from the uh, Biocane Barrage. So you're going to have to really respect the... Sorry, the Living Artillery. So you have to really respect the extra range that Kog'Maw has over Koki. Of course, big magic damage between the two of them. But I might even see a lane swap on the blue side, which you wouldn't usually expect in a Corky matchup against a champion that situationally is short range like Kog'Maw. The Maokai, one damage threat on this comp, really. But you don't need much more than a Kog'Maw. No, Snake have one job here. It's protect King Crystal here. Build up a nice big fortress for him to sit in and make sure it's safe. Flandre going to take Malka here. A champion that I've actually been very impressed watching him play, but makes a lot of sense. They need a front line. Malka has a very good utility tank. He's good for peeling for Crystal. And as you said, Snake only have one plan. And I feel like this is a game that's going to be dissected for months to come because we've seen GE Tiger specifically playing so wonderful the Jogamore comp. You know, prey on that Kog'Maw. Doing so many great things. Things Crystal, another noted Cogmore player. Not many teams have shown they have really a way to deal with the Juggermore in the late game. Okay, this match might not reach late game given just how strong their performance was in the last one, but counters to the Juggermore are at a premium, and maybe EDG has something to show us in that regard. I think the biggest question here is that Snake, you know, clearly had a very uh, distinct plan when they picked for this game, and they let Cassidy through, so they're either happy playing against it or they think it's not good against Juggermore because Koro is a fantastic Cassidy player. I mean, the best way to deal with Juggermore is to make sure that they don't get those big two, three item spikes across the supports and the Cogmore. If Cogmore can never build up damage, if the game ends at 25 minutes, you never get the purchase out of the very strong Juggermore comp. So I have to think they're going to go for the early finish. The, Co the Cassidy, though, locks them into a little bit of late game flavor with that pick, but they've got Corky, they've got Twisted 
fact they've still got a very strong mid game. Yeah, it's almost casting an insurance there from Coro in the top lane here. And I think Pawn is probably the focus here for EDD's Composor. Well, Def almost always going to play well in a champion like Corky, but you know what? Let's let him do the talking. We're getting straight onto the rift. And welcome back here for our second game between EDG and Snake here. EDG finished game one in style there against Snake in what was a very entertaining first game here. They're up a game now looking for the three points here in Snake. They don't want the reverse of history to be repeated here. They'd love to at least make it a split. And Beast gets on the Nunu. We haven't actually seen the Nunu come out from Snake for quite a while. It's actually fallen through picks and bans. So surprising to see it locked in. EDG, they're going for very early grouping. They want to invade. Yeah, really aggressive posturing here actually coming through there as well here. And... Actually, interesting to look through here as you look down the trinkets of EDG. Really aggressive. They actually have two different red trinkets at level one. Interesting. So they must have a specific plan. They must really want to get the lane swap and have the ability to scan our areas. They both use their scans. I don't know if they picked up a ward through it, but you have to think they're going to go back and change those early totems. Of course, you don't lose much. It only delays your your ward about 20, 30 seconds. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I think what you can do with the trinket system here and EDG clearly trying something a little bit different, which is nice to see. Def, though, actually moving in. Got good wards here on the right-hand side of the jungle for EDG. So they, I think, might be looking for the swap, but Snake have already put the Cogmore in the top lane. Swaps and counter swaps. It's hard to say what the teams are looking for exactly at level one, but the result is Cogmore in the top lane. At the moment, Corky and Annie rotating towards the bot. It looks like the lane swap will be on. Yeah, I think Black Lolly as well, knowing that there were trinket wards that Snake had put down, wants to go start on the side of the jungle that they don't know about. Flandre also going to start doing some of the Raptor camp as well, but we are going to break out into a lane swap now, so it's Crystal. Might even be 1v1 against the Cassidy. And I'm very surprised to see that Koro has not changed his sweeping lens for a warding totem, so of course he will not have a lot of early vision. Going to have to play very, very safe. If I was the enemy team and noticed this, turret dives seem like a great idea idea with the with no warding to even s spot an early turret dive. Yeah, but the early swap I think comes out in Snake's favor here. Crystal, I believe, has frozen the top side of the map, and they, uh, Deft could not make it down with Mako to try and get the freeze on, so he's not going to get a hard freeze. He'll probably try and slow push it, and as always, we're going to isolate the mid lane. So yeah, the mid lane stays isolated. The jungle follow is on for Snake. I worry for Koro because uh, five members, or even four members, it looks like the late invade to blue is the first a goal for Snake. Yeah, classic Snake. You're going to really have power in numbers and move through. Look to take away the blue buff. Should be able to get it. Actually, Black Lolly is already doing the same here. So Snake again, going to vertically jungle on the top side of the map and give Cogmore as much space as they possibly can. Usually you see the jungle follow coming through, even from Cass. And of course, he's not the best at a jungle follow. Doesn't provide too much damage at early levels. He's hit level two, so he's been able to sap a bit of experience. But you can see the pings already. Snake are kind of wondering, why not just clump up and go for the aggressive dive? I don't know. I mean, they're looking for it, at least in some capacity. Def actually takes a tower hit. He's been pushing this so hard down towards the bottom side of the map. So two very different things happening in these lands. Pawn actually going to go in there again. Good trend on Tabaka, but Baka winning out early. But Twisted Fate, no slouch on the auto attacks there, especially with a point in his E. I think the point you bring up is very important. The strong push actually dissuades the turret dive, because if it goes even or wrong, you lose so much if you mess out on the early minion waves being pushed into turrets. So pressure Maokai with the early pushing, ensure that he has to walk down bottom lane to soak up experience, and that does actually effectively reduce a lot of pressure on Korra. Yeah, Beast though does own EDG's left half of the jungle here, and this is again what we expected during the vertical jungling. Ella actually autoed a creep, so this wave is starting to push, and Snake is going to try and get some turret damage now. You can see the rotations continue. They were at a very strong point last game. You can see with both Black Lolly and Mako rotating to level 1, to the top lane, they still want to stop any uh, potential dive. Koro is getting dope here, no, it does flash quite late, but Snake can't quite get the kill. Black Lolo is also coming up, like you mentioned, Mako's there as well. First blood there onto the Nunu, but Crystal is here. Flandre actually pulled it up already at level two, and he got the double buffs. Now, Pawn, he's already activated Ghost. He does not want to flash without vision. He wants to pick up the double buffs he's himself. He's killed, though. That's not good news. Crystal finds the last auto. Ella actually cleans up the kill. The buff transfer not happening again here. I think Mako, yeah, does have the doubles right now, and Snake might dive in again. Flandre Tower diving with the Mako once more does go down there, but the double buff snack over to Baka here as it's just buff ping pong in the top lane. It's just insanity coming through with all the aggressive dust. Five deaths already in the first four minutes. This game, I thought the first game was quick. We're starting off with an even faster clip here. I mean, apparently Snake, despite picking a very late game oriented comp, 
can't help themselves when it comes to aggressive tower defense. But that's the funny thing, though. If you've got a late game comp, the late game comes closer. If you're both getting gold, it suits the late game comp because you're both building yourselves up. Corky, the only one who's been an onlooker this whole time, doesn't even have a massive CS advantage to show for not being involved in the kills. And the three assists, the goal's going to be very even across the map. Black Lolly's here in the top set. Ella has to try and tornado it up. He is going to get knocked up, I believe, but a good shield might keep him safe. Crystal, though, could be in trouble. Holds on to his flash very judiciously, and he'll back towards his turret. Yeah, had already used his heal, but was able to hold on to flash. The result, of course, is double buffs on Barker. So that's going to be even more difficult to, e to deal with the very early lane bully that is Lulu for this Twisted Fate. Suddenly, he's going to have to play behind. He's going to have to perhaps be the second person to hit six. Already has a slight level, level disadvantage in mid. The Destiny is going to need to be on point to justify this Twisted Fate pick. Yeah, and it's so weird as well because these are not standard lanes at this point. So where can Pawn even go if, to look for an early Destiny? That's a very interesting question, Patient Time. Of course, Kasten doesn't offer too much, especially pre-6. Of course, he will be 6 by the time that Pawn's Destiny comes through. But still doesn't offer too much in terms of a ganking lane. You're looking for CC in the lane. Maybe wherever Mako is is the safest choice for EDG. I think that's probably a good decision here as Baka might even get roamed on now as well. Playing pretty back here on the Lulu Mako. Doing standard Annie LPL things here. Level 2 on the support Annie. I mean, you don't need any more levels to get your stun pace through time, so I don't know what the problem is. I mean, at the end of the day, Annie in any team fight, she can flash in, stun people, and die. As long as those other people are dying, she's happy. And we saw that already in the top lane with the massacre that happened here. But Flandre will come back down to the top side. He's getting heavily denied in CS, unfortunately. Just trying to throw some saplings in, get the lane moving. But that AoE might cost him there, actually. The, his creep wave's going to push back now. And it's just interesting to dis dissect who took all the gold from those early trades. Mako was actually one of them. With the boots and mobility, already has a lot of map pressure. Early dragon coming through. I believe it is spotted by the ward that was already down from Snake. But, of course, with Cogmore in the top. And just not having a lot of pressure on the map. And now that Koro rotates to mid, it's going to be the first dragon to EDG you'd have to think. Yeah, we look at a lot of hyper carries and a lot of teams like to swap their uh, late game carry into a safe lane, in a 1v1 or even a 1v0, freeze the lane and get a lot of farm and get through the early game. But of course, if you do that, especially on the red side, this is what happens. Yeah, Dragon goes to EDG. That's the standard way, of course, with the vertical jungle, with the follow. If you're the ones that initiate the swap, if you got your Cogmore in the top, you're going to give away Dragon. All right, Nimeko down the bottom. Level 3 now, coming up in the world on this support, Annie. But uh, not quite ready to look at Flandre for a potential stun here. And Koro actually hanging out as well. Level 5 gank apparently coming in, but Pawn doesn't need the relief of pressure and just continues to farm out against Baka. So Destiny's complete. You know, we always consult Messiah when he talks about Destiny. It's always the first Destiny that he values the most. Of course, the amount of pressure the first one puts on will only reverberate with the second and third if it's successful. But of course, if it doesn't come together or if TF dies or loses a lot of pressure, you have to remember it's very difficult for Twisted Fate to push a wave in significantly enough to buy time when he goes for the Destiny against the Lulu. He's got uh -oh. so much wave clear, and Black Lolly, that's awkward. That's not a good showing for your second competitive game in the LPL. Does, unfortunately, get executed by the red buff. I don't believe he completed it, so he's even going to have to go back and saunter there with his tail between his legs to pick it up again. Of course, buffs do stay through death if you get executed, but didn't even pick up the buff. No, unfortunately. Doesn't even have the ulti on the rec side to rush back in and show it who's boss, but EDG instead will continue farming out. They'll take a bit of a hit there. Snake, a very slim gold lead, and the most important thing for them, they own the top side of the map, and Crystal is free farming. Yeah, and Beast, of course, he's uh, no has the extra knowledge. He's going for the early invade, but the rotation is going to come through from Pawn. He'll be the first to react. No further buffs going to be lost, at least just yet, for EDG. Yeah, but you can see the early sights on here, of course, a trademark of these jungle Nunus and Beast just trying to get some that almost level six gonna walk into the lane here as well, possibly give Barker a blood boil does there, and they might look to dive the bottom lane now. Considering it, there's four members on the bottom side of the map. Crystal, the only person who has no way to get there. Even with their rotational play with this Nunu, remember you do have Twisted Fate coming through. The, the destiny has been popped. They know what's happening. That's really funny. <laughs> they even get executed by the actually Koro coming in. Beast pops his ulti there. Max Ella goes down very low there to death as Pawn gets the first kill. Beast gonna go down as well. And actually that goes to Black Lolly. Now Baki getting dove on. That's gonna be a double kill for Pawn. Beautiful first destiny by Twisted Fate. We always talk about the use of destiny and the fact that Twisted Fate is so great to have on your team. Of course, if you're being invaded upon, if you're invading the enemy team, the destiny has the Real. Twisted Fates, they're always the first to react. And EEG in general, five members react to the aggressive invade. They pick up three kills. I'm pretty sure Def's Corky does more damage than mine. And they come out with a big advantage. Yeah, really strong stuff. And I was going to point out that it was funny that after Black Lolly got executed, that they would go invade the red buff. Looked like a dive potentially there as well. But pop the Twisted Fates all. He got a bit of vision. And it was better than they could have ever dreamed. The result, of course, is that Crystal does take down this top turret. Anything that lengthens the game is in Snake's advantage. Anything that gets this game later and later 
is what Snake are looking for. Okay, donating three kills, not ideal. They are behind in Dragon, but they're just trying to take advantage of a Black Lotus. He's obviously a little bit rattled, given that he's already been executed this game. Yeah, Crystal, though, now level seven, does have his Sheen going to go back and possibly spend a little bit more gold. Koro scaling up as well. Be interesting to see what build he goes for, but probably looking for a slightly later Rod of Ages. Deft, as always, ready to go here on the Corky. Sheen plus Phage and level seven still. The timing probably not going to be there 11 minutes at least. He's just got <laughs> a little bit of gold left after the first two parts. Needs 1,200 to finish off that Trinity Force. So probably 13, 14 minutes going to be for him. Still very standard par timing. Pawn, he's the big benefactor. He's building towards a Merlinomicon. Actually going for the big injection of AP right now for a bit more power with that Nilisi Large Rod. It will help his wave clear significantly. It's going to be the instant wave clear. Of course, you can throw that red card as the minions are breaking in a line, throw through the wild cards, and with this much AP this early, they're all going to die. Yeah, and that's kind of really what Pawn needs to do is get the waves pushing and be able to get out of the lanes and influence the other ones. Absolutely. Against Lulu, who has so much wave clear of her own, still going to take a couple of good lands, whereas if you can get one rotation through, it's just more time for you to go to another lane, in it and walk back to mid without your turret falling down early. Yeah, so EDG up in kills with Snake, uh, up in turrets currently. So a very even game, about a 300 gold lead there for EDG. Edward Gaming also have the first dragon, don't forget. And the second one's going to be back in a minute 50. So I wonder if Snake want to give this one up as well. It'll be very, very interesting to see that. Of course, they've rotated their top lane bottom. So the first indication is no if they've ended this lane slot that was coming through. Of course, they got the turret. They're safer now to have a turret to go back to. So it still makes sense for Snake to swap back. Mako... He's just hanging back. Not that interesting in experience. Even though he's level 5, you think he needs to rush towards Tibbers. But uh, he just wants to make sure Deft is very, very strong. Yeah, and Deft has been the benefactor of a lot of action in the early stages. See, good poke there by Crystal, actually, trying to get the wave into the But Deft doing his best to freeze it. As he's going to continue looking very strong on the cork. The tower, though, does get in the mid lane, actually. So pawn a lot of good pressure. I mean, significant that Twisted Fate's actually the first to get down a turret himself. Of course, they did a lot of damage as a team earlier. So it was already very, very low after the very early push in the three kills that came through. So it's good that they pick up that turret. Of course, that frees him up to Rome because you're going to see Lulu trying to answer that turret and anchor to mid to some degree. Koro himself is opening up a Rome with a minute left to Dragon. They're rotating their top lane up very early. He doesn't have teleport. So they want to make sure they have the numbers advantage if he needs to rotate if they want to clear this vision to set up their second Dragon. Yeah, Koro, they're going to walk back up here. Flandre, like you mentioned, does have his teleport, but I'm sure Koro will be back for this next Dragon in time. But was just maybe seeing if we could get something worked on there in the mid lane. That is Juggernaut there, I believe, on base. Nunu there as well. So going for very supportive, very tanky build. It makes a lot of sense, of course. Only really AD. The only reason to pick up a Warrior, the other famous enchant, will be just for those autos, those slaps coming through from Nunu. It doesn't really scale off AD, so smart to pick up the Juggernaut. No need to stack down the AP unless there was the unsighted Nunu with the massive ultimate. And uh, yeah, they're just trying to clear wars. This is one of the strategic holes, though. Without teleport available, Nunu understands. Just group with a couple of members and take down every ward and force the early roam from Korra. Crystal actually finished his Trinity Force now as well, so Snake might realistically be able to contest for this dragon. I mean, actually, we saw Corky go back and not have enough gold, so a little bit extra gold for Crystal means that you're correct. It is a risk, even at this point. Okay, Crystal's not the same Trinity Force user as Corky. Corky's the best user of all the statistics and passives that our item provides, but still, it's a significant item advantage. All the constituent parts are good, the Trinity Force completed is amazing. Yeah, Vision is going to get cleared out here now as well. Beast will team up with Bucket there to clear out a pink ward. They do have some Vision, there's another good pink ward in that brush just to the left there as well, but Snake are going to look to start the Dragon. They're going to need a pick here, EDG. They don't necessarily have an easy way to do it. Pawn does a lot of damage and has a lot of pokes, so they have to respect him, but look, Jeez. Crystal's already doing a lot of damage. This is one item on Crystal. Yeah, and he's going for Dragomor, staying in the front line, getting aggressive towards the carries and forcing EDG away. So we use this Dragomor term quite a lot and people might wonder, okay, it's just to protect the Cogmore, right? But the big thing about protect the Cogmore is it's always about defensive positioning coming out from the Cogmore. The Dragomor opens up aggressive positioning from the Cogmore. He goes to the front and he still should skill shots come up onto him. So many defensive peel utility ults coming through from his team that he'll still survive. They want people to focus the cog more because they have the help to build him up and be that strong frontline damage threat he can be. Yeah, and look, those ult is going to be aimed at cog more anyway, so might as well put him where he can be seen. Absolutely. And now Dragon going to get aggressive on the Scuttlecrab, going to go down here as well. But Snake, sorry. 
Well, Beast and the rest of Snake going to look to try and contest for this Dragon Pawn. Is off to the side on the Twist of Fate. Can, of course, provide vision, if nothing else, with his ulti death. Chunking out people as well, but Snake, still with an item up here on Crystal, have to try and contest now, I think. I can't demonstrate how important it is for EG to get this next Dragon. Okay, it won't decide the game, but you give any advantages, you seed any advantages to a Juggermore comp, you give them any sort of parity on turrets, on dragons, it just gets them closer and closer to what is such an oppressive late game for them. Teleport comes through, actually, from Flandre. He goes to the top lane. I guess that just seeds the dragon to EDG. Yeah, that's weird. I thought they had a good angle for it, but EDG is going to take it. An elongated dance around the dragon, but uh, EDG will actually pick up the second snake. Like you said, just give it away. I mean, the one thing you can say is that Fonjay picks up a lot of creeps doing that, gets closer to his Rod of Ages, and knows he'll have teleport available for the next dragon, because you know that EDG is going to rush it there, but there's no misunderstanding from Snake. They're giving that away with a purpose. We look at the gold, doesn't quite have enough for the Rod of Ages yet. The second dragon, look, it's not a big thing to give away. It, of course, gives the team position on the third with the exact timer. But I don't think there's any sort of ambiguity about what's happened in that trade. For whatever reason, they called him away. Yeah, I mean, they just, I guess, didn't want to risk it was the thing. Because Fondre is actually going tanky here as well. Probably the right to score plus the Banshee. So I could have probably had a Rod of Ages if he really rushed for it. Didn't go for it. And Koro is almost at his as well. It's a little bit delayed, but he's kind of at the upper echelon of where he can realistically get the item. But in general, that things went better than expected for EDG. They thought they'd have to commit to a fight. They weren't really item tuned to win. Like, it would have been a very close fight. They're able to go back and shop soon with Corky, sitting on. More than enough gold to pick up the Trinity Force and start working towards that Sorcerer's Shoes. That's probably why he's staying in lane. Pawn's going to push towards level 11, about one minion away from picking that up. The second Destiny, it actually hasn't happened yet. The first one was so important in the game. You know, we've seen from Pawn, from Cool, the consistent flavor coming through from these Twisted Fates. The split push, you know it's going to be on in the late game. Yeah, Baka gets his blue buff there as well to help counter push some of the waves that are coming through in mid as well. Crystal's now down the bottom. Tending to the minions there in that side of the map. Pawn, there we are, level 11. And like you mentioned, pretty much instantly clearing these waves. A very interesting build, though. 40% CDR so, so early with the blue buff actually just going to be slightly over the cap. Very important. He's going to have excellent wave clear. He's going to have excellent turret damage because although it's not the Lich Bane, you're going to get the blue card, the red card, the gold card even if you're harassed onto the turret that much more often. So it's just fine in terms of build. But he's working towards the zone, as you have to think, with that Needless Large Rod. Crystal there, as you mentioned, does get the Grump there as well. Death down the bottom side. Does have a Trinity Force, not quite the Sorcerer. It's actually a Longsword instead. Probably going for a Bloodthirst, but presumably that Longsword's a Vampiric Sector. So you might ask why with the Merlin Why go for it? And the big factor you have to consider here is how much healing is there on the Snake side for their Hyper Guy. And Wild Cards have such a large AoE and such long range, you're able to consistently... Uh, apply the Merlinomicon debuff to the enemy team. That sounds like a small factor when there's no Soraka, there's no obvious heal, but between the Janna healing and just all the supportive abilities, anything to help shut down this Juggermore in the late game or even the mid game could be critical for EDG. Yeah, top tower goes down there. EDG will take out Snake's out of turret. They're the last one that they own there as well. I mean, again, Snake playing very patiently. They have no real reason to take unnecessary risks. They just need to make sure they get a, get to a point where Kog'Maw's looking good. And it, the onus is on EDG. The game is on some sort of timer here, you have to think. It almost feels like double AD versus Mundo type of timer that comes through with the Juggernaut comp. In the late game, there's just been no comp that's been able to reliably beat them or even pressure them just because of how strong Kog'Maw is. His scaling with the percentage magic damage on the Biocane Barrage, you just add standard AD items. He does so, so much damage. It's so hard to take him down. He's even going to have the Nunu Blood Boil on him just for an embarrassment of riches in terms of attack speed and damage. As I see a smirk coming through from a certain producer. Kog'Maw is so, so strong in the late game, and they have to pressure him. Even though they've got things like the Rod of Ages, they've got scaling of their own, nothing compares to the scaling of the Juggermore. No, and for me, it's Pawn who just hasn't pulled the trigger on the, trigger on the second Destiny yet. But the Destiny's active. Is it going to go in potentially? As popped it, like you said, I guess just wants a vision, and Snake are very comfortably playing back towards their tier two. And the vision does give them position on whatever kind of advantage they're trying to get. They're pushing in aggressively to this bottom lane turret. The big thing to consider, without the Zonyas, the suicide port is a real risk, so it's understandable to not want to go too aggressive with your positioning, not go full Messiah without that Zonyas. Well, slightly missed time, unfortunately, for Pong, because he just got his Zonyas hourglass. So awkward. Could have done it if he had it. Yeah, a little awkward. They're 40% CDR, though. I mean, it's not going to be too long of course it does have quite a long cooldown at level 11 i believe it's just over three minutes or around that three minute mark but not completed just yet it's chugging down pretty quickly for pawn i think that's the other reason for the cooldown build that we've seen on a couple of other twist of fate players as well i think assassin from king comes to mind in recent games so again just 
use more ulties. But this is not what porn went the last time we saw the Twisted Fate. So I think the fact that the Merlin Nomicon is so core to their style and, and the champ pool that the enemy teams have picked, that he kind of just seeded early pressure, seeded the less damage. Of course, without the Sorcerer's Shoes, the less flat magic penetration, especially early, is going to really affect you. So going for the CDR build, it gives him a lot of utility. It pigeonholes in terms of utility until he finishes the Zonias. But now with the Zonias, can be the playmaker that Pawn and EG have always cried out for, and Pawn has fit seamlessly into this lineup. Yeah, Pawn's just a fantastic player. Has pretty much since from day one here when he started playing with EDG, it just fits so well. And that's been the big story for EDG as a team. They've just clicked instantly almost, it feels like. You know, you could talk about their old lineups, talk about the Koreans being a strict upgrade, but at the end of the day, they're just a good team and they've always looked like a good team. I think we took a little bit longer to warm up to the new lineup just because, again, Name to Def didn't seem like a strict upgrade. Of course, he's been wonderful so far this season. Def, he needs so many portals. He has been excellent, but it was, you know, it was a... It was a slight upgrade, at most. That was the kind of thing there. And of course, there was the potential of the language, uh, the language barrier coming into the team and taking them back from their rotational late game shot calling strategy of previous years. Deft has been so consistent though, and the Corky especially, the rotations they've been able to do. But Pawn is the big, uh, the big factor, I think, that's kind of changed this team's identity. Going from the wave clear mid, -clean, mid laner to someone who started the season playing Fizz, initiating for his team, now playing Twisted Fate, equally able to initiate for his team. The strategic flexibility to move from protect the death to more offensive comps, the comps even around Pawn, it just gives EDG so many more strengths in their book. Yeah, and all they need to do now is figure out a way to break the Dragomore at this point, because Snake, again, they're just very patient. The next dragon is coming up, though. That's a crucial point. EDG would be their third if they got it, which will definitely help some of the rotations here. But Snake are playing very far back. They're happy to play in the lower half or lower third of the map here for themselves. And they're picking up farm. Everything's going fine. I mean, if the most they get is a third dragon, that's maybe not a massive point. As Beast takes a nice burst of damage and the teleport's coming through. Yeah, Fundra's moving in. Korra's actually coming in as well. So Pawn actually forced to flash away. Fundra going to go over the top. Sna uh, Crystal, sorry, going to flash after him. And they should be able to lock him down. A good stun card lands in, but Pawn can't get anything else done and does go down. That's a free kill, actually. Yeah, Pawn was completely separated from his team. They're looking for some exit kills to, to balance it. And there's the flash yeah, divots. Bucket goes in there. There's the first kill. Death gets it going in. Now Black Lolly in trouble. Actually, Crystal carting back around there. There's the next kill for Death is in the front line going in. He gets exhausted as he moves in on top of Crystal. A great trigger to Phosphorus Bomb there. And Koro is in the mix there. Can he stay survive Crystal? He does somehow live. Mako going to go down as well. And a full ace there for Snake. The team split coming through from EDG was a massive problem. Mako, he's alive right now. Actually looking for some autos to get the, uh, the passive through. The visionary passive. He's going to fall eventually. You couldn't kill the Cogmo fighting on all those chokes with no wards down. The Destiny was available, not used to even grant vision. I can understand it's such an important team fight cooldown, but they kind of needed it. They got vision juke so extensively, it forced the overly aggressive Valkyrie coming through from death. And the result is a dragon and suddenly massive momentum for Snake. Yeah, and again, Snake buy more time. Six minutes, you have to think they're going to buy at least for that dragon. A ton of gold there after that fight as well. To lose a mid-game team fight, as EDG playing against this comp of Snake is disaster. And that's the thing, like, you think, okay, why is there six minutes longer? It's just the reality that to finish out this game, unless you can get a massive pick and break the base earlier than expected, you realistically do need a massive advantage, like for example, the five dragons. So it's gonna take six minutes longer at minimum to pick up the six, the five dragons through from EDG now that Snake have picked up one. Of course, that's the stats, the 6% AD and AP is going to make the shield and the damage stronger from both Crystal and the rest of the comp. And this is already some interesting face yeah, checking. face checks there as well. Fondre going to dive in. Crystal in the back line going to go in and Baka actually pops the ulti onto Fondre. Beast uses his ulti there as well. Black Lolly diving in the back onto Crystal, but Crystal gets the first kill there onto the Rex. Like Korra diving in the back, pawn around the side there as well. They snipe Crystal with a twisted fade ulti. Baka looking to go down here as well. And there's the ace for EDG. And the big hero there is Pawn, both cancelling the channel on the absolute zero, and then the flank coming through. It looked so great for Snake. The percentage health was coming onto Flandre. He was a massive tank in the front, but with the flank, suddenly Crystal was ambushed in the back line. Nothing he could do. It should be barren for EDG. Wonderful team fight from them. The cardinal sin of Dragon Ball seems to be don't Lulu ulti the Maokai. 
The, the cooldowns are there to use for Crystal. Any fight that you don't get to use them on your Cogmo is a fight that just goes a little worse for you. Although people are getting executed by this Baron. Actually, a lot of people. Pawn even has to use his done. His Black Lolly saves the day there, and they do finally get the Baron. The last revenge of the Baron pastry time. So often slain with nobody taken down. But pick up to us. We see the replay. This looks great for sake. Watch when the the uh, wild growth is used on Flandre. Suddenly everyone's chunked down. You're like, oh my goodness, EDG might lose this game right now. But suddenly it's so different because once that big cooldown is used on Crystal, he's a sitting duck the moment that he's back. Nothing he can do against against uh, the, the twist of fate coming through. And that's the important factor for Snake. And that's the important factor for the Juggermore. Always have the Cogmo at the front. Of course, when you're face checking, that doesn't make sense, but you can see the reasoning. If any of the cooldowns are not used on Crystal, if he dies partway through the fight, the start of the fight, you can look down the Snake lineup. There's no other damage. No, it's just Crystal here, the King, who is trying to put the team on his back. He does have a few more items coming in and that last fight. I mean, we criticized Barker a little bit for not being able to ult Crystal, but he was just out of position in that fight. Couldn't add shields, couldn't add anything. I mean, it's hard to be in position when it's a gank brush, basically, there. There was not too many things they could do, but you can see how Twisted Fate is actually a, a very important champion against this Juggermore because he always has the ability to go in aggressive. Whether it's going in aggressive with the Messiah-like plays and the instant Zonias, whether it's getting the red or gold card in the back line, he's someone that can ambush uh, Kog'Maw wherever he positions, whether it's very aggressively, whether it's very conservatively. And I do like the Twisted Fate and the reactions coming through with the Merlinomicon. They have ideas of how to deal with the Juggermore, but it's still 25 minutes in. They're still building up gold. They don't have a big enough advantage, and there's no reason that Snake can't take this game in the late game. Yeah, they've kind of kept Edergy at arm's length here a little bit, just getting things moving here. We do actually have the Bloodthirst to finish now for Crystal, so really putting the Juggernaut part of the Juggernaut comp, I guess, in. Lots of life shield and a good shield there as well. And it's interesting to see the... Blade the Ruin King coming through from Corky. Of course, some people tilt towards this item second over Bloodthirster. Almost always is the Bloodthirster pick up from Death. He realizes there's a lot of health stacking coming through on the Snake's side. A lot of magic resist being built. Picking up the Blade of the King for a bit of self-peel, for a bit of percentage damage onto this Beast Flandre frontline. And of course, the Wild Growth just amplifying the health statistic. Blade the Ruin King might actually be doing more work than Blade than the Bloodthirster in this situation. Yeah, and the Baron Buff doing work there, Edergy. Just managed to pick that one up, but do take a turret out in the bottom side of the map as a result. Four to two now in those objectives, and EDG creeping up in gold. Six and a half thousand gold ahead now. It's not enough, Pastry Time. That's one thing I've learned about the Juggermore combos. It's never enough gold until you break the base. Getting down an inhibitor is the major factor, because you look at the amount of wave clear coming through from stake. It's massive. I mean, Crystal not tuned for wave clear, perhaps, but of course, Lulu does so much wave clear. There's a lot of help from Maokai and Janna. Uh, there is significant wave clear coming through, so breaking the base, that's the big thing that EDG want to do. The Baron buff, it buys them a lot more map pressure, but until they take one of those inhibitor turrets, they're still going to be wanting more. Yeah, so our next pressure point, you're actually going to be the Dragon coming up. A minute 30 there for that one would be EDG's third and Snake's second for the respective teams here. So Dragon up, I mean, again, EDG have had trouble forcing Snake out of their base and trying to fight them, but Dragon's the next best point for them to actually pick a 5v5. Right. Their base is such a safe place to retreat, to buy time. Again, the game is still on a pseudo timer. It's not Mundo, it's not double AD versus Mundo strictly, but Cogmo was so, so strong in the late game. Going for the Blood does just for a bit more insurance, of course, gives him lifesteal, does have the potential to get through an assassination, as long as he doesn't die instantly. And look, to be honest, with the cooldowns we've talked about, it's so hard to take down this Cogmo instantly, and then can just heal up after the first round of spells is complete. It delays the big damage at this point. Of course, Bloodthirster second, not going to be doing a big amount of damage like Infinity Edge, like any sort of Phantom Dancer or Static Shiv, but it makes him that much more safe in fights, and he's still the crown jewel of the Snake lineup. Yeah, I think Crystal's going for Last Boost for third as well, simply because he has to get it at some point, I think is how he feels. I mean, there's no major armor items yet here in the EDG lineup, but Crystal's sort of priced into that item third. I mean, you say that, but he still has an item start with the pot, so of course he could just pick up a BF sword and work towards Infinity Edge. Of course, it's a bit... Once you pick up the pickaxe, you have the option, you have the flexibility, so there's no reason not to pick up the pickaxe. It's going to be an Infinity Edge and a Last Whisper eventually, but I think at this point, no rush to pick up the the Last Whisper. No real armor items completed. They just want to deal with the latent damage of the magic damage of the other four members and explode this little ca catapult. Ooh, Dragon is back up very soon. Three seconds left here. Snake moving into position actually on top of the Scuttlecrab. Good ward there as well. Ella will clear out the very sneaky EDG ward there in the pit. Crystal going to take out the Scuttlecrab. No, can't quite do it. Deft actually going to move in. Beast bombs in. He really wants it and they do manage to pick it up. They do manage to pick it up. It was only a small amount of damage to take it down but that Scuttlecrab deceptively tanking in. Blacklog is in the middle of a lot of members 
Thunders. They're not committing to anything. The Teleport is used, though, and so is Koros. Thunder is pretty tanky. He's actually got Spirit Visage now, and Black Lolly's still going to get caught out of position here. They're going to run in on top of him, but they don't want to commit too hard, it seems like. But Black Lolly taking a bit of damage. Nunu doing some work here, but Crystal biting up, and Koros set up a beautiful flank around the side. Thunder dives in on Tomeko. Snake are trying to split them up, but they don't want to get too split here. Thunder now going to get aggressed on in the back there. Crystal does get the kill on Tomeko, and Beast off the side, zoning the pawns in the back line. They're going to try and get to him. Crystal gets dived on, but he flashes up beautifully out from under a pawn that gets the kill onto Barker. Black Lolly in trouble as well. Just a one for one so far. Yeah, fighting on so many frontiers, but Flanjo re engages. He dives in onto Kari. Now Beast going in the top as well. Cassidy and Solo here. Crystal just in, but he's out of mana. Needs the W back though. Does get a pawn. Beautiful on his Kari. They're going to be the next target. There's a kill. The second coming through as well. Three for one. Now might be more. And Snake win the big fight. But that's the second time that Snake had been fighting with the terrain advantage. The second time EDG have been forced to fight some bite spots. It's going to be Black Lolly falling down. They're not going to stop with this yeah, turret dive. Spit on there as well for the next kill. They get another one there as they complete the ace. Kind of make her still alive, but Snake will get another dragon. And suddenly Crystal is 8-1-4 and four, and the EDG game plan is in tatters. I feel like they just felt forced to engage because Black Lolly was caught in no man's land. The new member on this lineup, they went for the flank, but this is the second time they fought around the same terrain. The enemy blue buff and they were juke. There was never any ability to get any sort of damage onto Cogmore. He lived very healthily with the Bloodthirster lifesteal especially. They went for the assassination with Pawn's ultimate. It's just not enough damage though. And pastry time, second team fight loss, now even in Dragons. The moment this game gets even in gold, it starts to fade away for EDG. And it's kind of fading a little bit now as well as Crystal even picked up a blue buff there in the last little exchange. And thankfully for him, Bioarchan Brudge no longer costs mana. Forgot about that one there. So he was able to use it freely despite being very low. Bucker split pushing out on the top side of the map. Now there's a fiendish codex actually in his inventory currently. And Crystal decides for the Never Die build. He's got QSS, even the Alacrity boots for a bit more move speed. Of course, he was probably going to get the Whimsy coming through from Lulu, stacking AP anyway. Going to be a very, very fast... Void Monster, but with the QSS, the Alacrity Boost, now the Last Whisper. He's basically got the cost-effective poke build. He's still got a lot of life still. He's going to shred through whatever armor, so of course it future-proofs him in terms of the armor that's going to be built up on the EDG side. And suddenly, I mean, even Deft looks like he has no answer. He's working towards the Last Whisper himself. Yeah, I mean, future-proofing is a, a great way to put it here for the Kog'Maw, but simply put, it just gets better here for Snake. Crystal's at three items, and this is his springboard, I like to think, for late game carries. Once you get to three items, especially when you have life steal in the mix as well, it only gets better for you from that point. It's one of those cases where, okay, Last Whisper, may, you know, he would have preferred an Infinity Edge, perhaps, but he used all his gold at the same time. It's such an efficient spend to have so much defensive stats between the Alacrity Boots and the QSS. And, you know, had enough gold to finish the Last Whisper, probably not enough to pick up the BF sod unless he sold his Dorans, but no rush to do that. And look, the build, it's not ideal, like it's not optimum damage, but it is a very, very safe build for the crown jewel of Snake. Yeah, Infinity Edge is coming, don't forget here. That's Crystal's next big purchase, you have to think, as we look through the rest of the items. We have one Mikhail so far there for Ella. Crystal doing what he's supposed to do here, just running forward and Wing Koro. I mean, you say running, he moves so, so fast with the Whimsy. Pawn is trying to create map pressure, but you see how fast he has to react. He started walking towards the bottom lane wave, just caught a to cause a bit of map pressure, because that's what we've seen from Cool from Pawn. It's just being a nuisance, split pushing with Twisted Fate. But this Snake lineup can dive. It does so much damage. One W doing half of Mako's life. And he just can't protect these structures. And I love that Crystal isn't even hitting the towel with his W up. He's actually running past it and just trying to auto people. I mean, at the end of the day, if Crystal's cursing one thing, it's the soft movement speed cap, because he's got the blood <laughs> boil coming through from Nunu, the whimsy. Jana's passive. So much move speed coming through from his allies. He's He's going to be moving around these fights at lightning speed, and there's just so little you can do if you're EDG. Yeah, I mean, they're just... Nothing you can do is correct here. Crystal does take out the tower. That's the fourth there for Snake. We'll even it up. Baron is a threat here as well. EDG do have a nice wave pushing in the bottom, I believe, as well. But Snake, they're going to set something up here. Even if they don't get it, they'll force a fight. I just I don't understand how you can die with Mikhail's Crucible being finished. The, uh, the QSS comes through. It's already quite speedy. We've mentioned that. But then the Whimsy. Then Janna's disengage. The extra Blood Boil coming through. Even the Shield coming through from the Locker Alliance side. Because why not? He's so tanky. He can be in the front line. Juggermore's good for a reason, basically. It is time. indeed. And Snake are the team in the LPL that looked to play it. They had a game on, I believe, yesterday, in fact, where they got yes. a win, but it looked a little shaky. But it wasn't quite as one note no. as this comp. There's not even an argument of damage in this comp. When OMG ran the comp, they were like, all right, just give Call an assassin, whatever. He went Zed in the mid lane. Kind of unsettled the whole comp. This is one-minded. This is what Starhound World Club wishes they'd been running the whole season with Name. 
They can't do it just yet. Maybe next week is the rumor. But Snake, they're performing it to a T. Yeah, and Snake just looks so good with this comp as well. Clearly have done some of the homework. Tightened it up since the last time we saw them play it. And Crystal, just such a good hyper carry player. Looks so comfortable. He's already looked comfortable on Cogmore. He was playing it before it was cool. And uh, looks good now that there's a full comp built around him. Suddenly I want to see a hipster Cogmore skin. <laughs> As I'm looking at the CS values coming through, Cogmore's the highest. That's pretty good if you're Snake. But Twisted Fate's been just fine. He's still able to one-shot the minion waves. That's an important thing. He's creating a lot of pressure, but realistically can't walk up to Flandre, especially once Flash is up and Flandre in a few seconds. The pick potential still exists. Very speedy Cogmore, you have to remember. He's able to rotate around the map very, very fast. Not yet three dragons. For either team, two apiece, I mean, add 5% more move speed. Why not? Just yeah, throw it all yeah, in Yeah, love that you mentioned that, because that's our next tension point in this game. A minute 30 now until that next dragon does come up, and the Baron is a big threat as well. We're 35 minutes into this game almost here, so two big objectives on the map, and Snake, you know, they're looking good. They've got a, a good, not advantage, but they've got a good position right now in this game, but they still have to be very careful. There's not any real deletion damage to speak of, though, Patriot Time. Who is the person that's going to get onto this Cogmore and explode him? TF doesn't have the items to do that yet. With the Lich Bane getting a bit closer, but with all the peel, the wild growth, the linear engage right now, even if everyone suddenly flashed onto Cogmore, there's so much disengage and extra health and shields to give him that you just don't have the damage to burst through him with one rotation of spells. And if he's able to start auto-attacking, we all know how these team fights go. Yeah, and Crystal's actually not going to go for an IA that I thought he might get. He's actually got a Static Shiv as his fourth item. I mean, there's a lot of extra power right now. Of course, he's going to be item capped very, very soon, Page Time. Don't forget that. So he's going to be able to switch through between the items. I mean, stacking attack speed is probably not the ideal, but because of a lot of power right now, and he can just go and do plenty of damage in a fight. Yeah, Flandre tying up Pawn in the bottom side of the map as well. Black Lolly there in eats some damage and you know, just takes a couple, take a couple of chunks there. About 150 of his health taken off there. Just trying to see 2.3 attack speed. And that's without Blood Boy or running. That's a little bit scary. So it's going to be very close to the attack speed cap, you'd have to think. At the 2.3, 2.5 being the hard cap. He's starting Baron himself. They're not worried at this point. The Destiny is active. They're aware of this Baron. They are as well here, but Chris are going to turn on Black Lolly, diving in the back there, but the Dragomore is just so tanky here. Flandre actually moving as well. A great ulti there for Beast to zone them off. Mako getting chunked down as a pawn looking low there as Crystal just can't, cannot die in this team comp. They're diving in. So it actually, they do the damage, but it's not enough. The ulti from Dragomore to Kevin, death really wants to kill, and he does manage to get the shot down, but it'll cost him his life as a result. Gets a second kill as that, and Koro is clean. Cleaning house here, Ella trying to dive away. Cory gets the double there as he takes out Ella. And Flandre actually might be able to kill him. Eight people dead so far. Only one more can live, and Koro is the last one standing. Koro is actually the last person saying not a lot of damage, but enough to take down the Cassidan. Finally, Crystal dies, but at what cost, Pastry Time? That's the big issue you have to talk about. Not sure if they're going to have all these summoners available to repeat that in a few minutes' time. Okay, Crystal's Flash and Healer down, but the, uh, the, the cooldown on the, the QSS, the cooldown on the Mikhail is going to come up soon. They got what they wanted, but it's not enough to get a big victory. We're going to see the replay coming through. The Destiny was activated first, so Batlady takes a lot of damage before the fight starts. Instantly dies, does the Lulu, of course. Wasn't able to use the wild growth on the priority target once, but Crystal's position is very, very safe at the back. It requires Death to basically go full hero mode to pick up the kill. That's Flash, Valkyrie, all used, puts him in harm's way, will die. One for one, Death for, Co for the Cogmore. That's just fine, to be honest, given the team comp they're against. It requires a lot on Koro having the mana, having the items to do consistent damage, but Flandre, too tanky, will take down Koro eventually. I guess that gives EG a bit of hope, specifically when we see the Void stuff coming through from Koro. Maybe he'll be able to do the consistent damage, but someone needs to kill Crystal. Yeah, this dragon actually going to get low here as well. Black Lolly might entertain a Celia. Going to dive in the back. Nunu, though, is able to pick it up, and now Black Lolly going to get chucked out of this one. 5v4 now for Snake, and they get the third dragon. It's just not worth dying, Patient Time. Having four, five members against four for 45 seconds to, con to contest a third dragon is absolutely not worth it. And suddenly, Baron becomes the easiest objective in the world to pick up. Yeah, Snake going to rotate in for it there as well. Flandry. Very large on the Mako. Looks like he's chugging an elixir of iron here. And Snake will just clean out some water. And they'll either start or bait Baron. Pawn does use the ulti. Good use of death for vision, but that only works once. In fact, they're going in. Flandre now going to dive in on Tameko as well. Going to get low there as Flandre is just so deep in the back. Koro getting chunked out from afar by Crystal's W. Flandre gets the next kill. Now it's 5v3. Yeah, suddenly fighting in a tunnel with Righteous Glory Maokai right at the front is so, so easy for Snake. Black Lolly will be up in six seconds. He's able to use his ultimate to get close. Doesn't have a tunnel right next to the Baron, though, and you have to think it's all going to fall down. Twisted Fate and EDG rotate to pick a turret in the mid, but 
nothing. It's going to be Baron. Yeah, Baron is going to go down. The turret is a small consolation there for EDG, but that's not really enough here. And EDG, they're kind of running out of options here. Honestly, the only one left might be to split push to victory. And the, it's worth knowing, though, base time, is that EDG won a fight. They killed the Cogmas. You might be thinking, all right, why can't that happen again? Remember, they all had to be positioned around a cove in the Baron pit. There were plenty of people still DPSing Baron, just peeling off of Baron. The terrain was not working in their advantage. They weren't able to spread their threat. Not threats, it's just a single threat. Very, very well. Crystal had to be... Uh, as his positioning was very, very difficult. It's going to be different in a 5v5 situation when there's more space for him to retreat to. Whether he's at the front, whether he's peeling off to the back, that was one of the positions where Crystal was going to be the most at risk. It just gets better for him as this game goes on. Yeah, and it's looked good so far here for Snake. Almost 40 minutes into this game. Still don't have a gold lead, worth noting here. They're only 3,000 gold behind, though, and that gold lead is quickly diminishing in its actual value. Just watching the 631 move speed Kogma with Whimsy rush around the map. Cogmos, uh, Kastan, sorry, is trying to create map pressure, does not have teleport. So, I mean, Snake, to be honest, when they know their destiny is down, specifically when they know their teleport's down, they can be so assertive, push up their wards, be aggressive. They have the Baron buff riding. I'm not sure if they're going to look to Siege just yet. They're all backing away, adding items. It's a Mercurial Scimitar, so it's six items. I'm going to say that with inverted commas just because there's going to be an Infinity Edge at some point. They doesn't need to have the Static Shiv. He could always switch that out. For now, though, these are the six items that he's put together. Most gold in the game by far is Crystal. And Juggermore's in full swing. Pretty scary to say this is his first six items here for Crystal, which is effectively what's going on right now. EDG, again, still have decent damage here. Pawn actually has basically full built there as well on his Twisted Fate. Deft is four items with good uh, damage coming through. Is that Crystal? Actually might have been caught here. Ellie going to come in, and Cora just almost gets deleted by the Cogwon. He's forced to get out there. The slow will follow him, and Crystal going to try and snipe him. A good rip will keep him safe for now. Black Lolly actually does get Ella, so Snake will come in, and it's 4v5. In the transition, it's 5v4. Of course, Cora won't be able to influence this fight. Has teleport soon, but Pawn's been caught. Yeah, he's got slowed down there by Chilling Smite. Plus the Snowball. Even the ulti going to come in as well. Pawn will use the Zonis, but he won't live for much longer. And Crystal gets another kill. So the teleport is available. Coral will be able to influence the fight soon. He's actually backing. He's not in base yet. And Snake are going in. Yeah, Crystal there. Comically just leaping forward. Flunder actually in the back as well. Canceling some backs out. The T2 turret will get melted here by the Cogmore damage that's coming through. And you saw Death's Corky in game one. Crystal score looks very similar this game. Still don't have that gold lead, but it doesn't look like it matters. They're spending their gold so efficiently. In fact, they're just stacking it on the Cogmore and riding him to victory. It just zooms around. 630 move speed with the whimsy. Bit more AP come through from Lulu. Might be able to add it up. There's nothing EDG can do. Pretty scary that this is without Infinity Edge for uh, Cogmore as well, but Crystal just so potent on these hyper carries. Look, he's running in again. There's nothing he can do. There's just no counterplay. I can hear Vrooms around the room as he's doing a lot of damage to this structure. Of course, the uh, Siege Minion doing a lot of damage too, and that's going to be the inhibitor turret, and you'd have to think the first inhibitor of the game. I mean, the whole point is you cannot stop the Dragomore once it starts moving, and Dragomore has started moving. I mean, it started rolling pastry time. It's going fast, but here comes the engage. Yeah, ulti the ulti, Crystal Black Lolly there gets killed instantly. They're deaf now. The next target is old Mako going to pop his Talisman and try and get up, but Crystal almost unrelenting in his pursuit. Koro going to move in as well. Beast gets low, but a good chill from Ella is going to keep him safe. Plundering in the back line. Going to try and make a difference. Gets low as well, but the heal's now coming in as well. Crystal still alive, of course. Mako almost gets three shot there and actually will go down to a great play stop there by Crystal. And Cogmore's just taken over. But the Destiny's been popped. I don't know if there's a Destiny that can get a kill, but Koro's going in himself. Good ulti there by Ella as well. Crystal still at full health there. They have to kill him in one round and they just can't do it. Koro going to get locked down there by Fundra. Crystal chasing Pawn now going to get the kill. The Zonis comes in. That actually might be enough. No, it's not. And Pawn goes down. Koro's the next to fall. Deft wants it so bad. 16, 2 and 8. Nothing Deft can do. This was the position Deft was in the last game. But when you're so set up to succeed, it looks easy from Crystal. They're just able to take out another inhibitor turret. Deft has to respect the Biocane Barrage range. To be honest, the only thing Crystal could do is a bit of CDR to get that Biocane Barrage available a little bit. It's only when he gates himself with that ability on cooldown does it that he looks mortal. I think Elamite by a Zeke's Herald here. <laughs> I mean, that's all that's left right to make him bigger. We're running out of items to make the Cogmore any bigger. I mean, yes, Infinity Edge can come through for Crystal. That might be the swap. But how much gold does he have, actually? That's very stupid. 3,900 gold in the bank. If only he could donate it to some of his teammates. Give a Zeke's Herald away. You know, give a bit more AP to Lulu to get the Whimsy faster. Even Janna pick up a bit of AP and get some more scaling going on the AD coming through from the shield. I wish we could snapshot just... 
If you gave all his buffs in the open, what he would have. And I see you smiling. They did it again. Snake have double locket and double McHale's fully committing to protecting King Crystal. And that's the thing about Beast Nunu. I find it hard to believe that he's only played it the eight times. Seven and one. We haven't seen it for a few games. But the build flexibility. You can build whatever the hell you want on Nunu once you get tanky enough. Has the McHale's now. It's not for Draven this time. It's for someone who can be aggressive with his positioning. It's just another heal. And by tanky enough, we of course mean he has a thorn mail and a ninja tully. Because that's about as tanky as Beast is getting apart from his sidestone. Cogmore has swapped out the first, swapped out a couple of items actually. We got more attack speed, fan rent and bladed the ruin king. I now. mean, like he doesn't need boots, basically. I mean, he's losing on, oh, on he a bit of boots. flat movement speed, but he doesn't need the boots. It's reminiscent of Keith McBrief and his double phantom dancer. It doesn't quite have double phantom dancer. He has every offensive item. He's got whimsy. He's got Jana passive. He's got so many movement speed augments. He's working against the cap anyway. He's crashing against it so hard. Why not make it easier on yourself? Yeah, sure. Missing out on boots here in this compass crystal. Now gets a red buff just to make it even scarier. Baron back in a minute 10 here as well. And EDG, they just can't kill the Cogmore. I mean, it's just crazy how much of a time you're on against this uh, protect the combo, this Juggermore comp. They were doing so well early, you have to remember, they were making the rotations, they had the Outer Ring of Turrets down first, but it just reached a critical point, the fight around the enemy blue buff especially. The first one, it looked bad for EDG from that point. You can't make too many missteps against Juggermore. The second one, that was their death sentence. Didn't need a Thresh to confirm that. And Snake, they just keep pushing, and EDG, they're, they're just sitting back, they're being conservative with their positioning. They're just hoping for a miracle. Yeah, I mean, if they can somehow kill this Cogmore, we mentioned it, it's just one damage trap. Flandre casually teleporting from base. He has a Void Staff on his Maokai. And he has the Home Guard boots, you'd have to think, to try for an engage. They want Death. He was going in, actually, assumed he was going to press the W. Death gets Whoa. turned down to half health in two shots. And now Flandre going to dive in the back. Crystal going to move in as well. Black Lover going to dive in once but he's kiting back so well there. Rek'Sai going to be the first kill to go down to Baka. Mako follows soon there as well. Chorus forced to zone. The rest of Snake are running in, and Crystal is just unstoppable. Rest in peace, EDG. A couple of members of Snake might fall down, but there's nothing they can do against the Juggernaut. No, you can't stop the Juggernaut here, and Crystal moving in for the last kill here. Death will complete the S. He actually takes it on, to, makes it competitive, but too many shields. Crystal moves in, EDG tap the mat, and what a series there. Well deserved that it. it's split 1-1. One, one. The surrender comes through. There's this no answer to the Juggermore. EDG, one of the best teams in the world. They tried their best. It looked at terms where like Pawn could deal with it with their very aggressive positioning available from Twisted Fate and the Destiny, but it wasn't enough. They were outscaled, and that second fight around the blue buff just decided the game. And you know, EDG might be happy to uh, not get 2 0 again by Snake. They'll hold on to first place as well, crucially, with only a point each going to both these teams, but Snake. I'm almost surprised they didn't pull out Juggermore in game one with how well they played that second game. And it might be the point where you just have to blind ban Kog'Maw, something that we haven't talked about for so long in competitive play. But you need to respect that this is the team of any team in the LPL that are set up to succeed with the Juggermaw. It'll be interesting to see what EDG take away from this series. Because look, if the Kog'Maw was banned out, if Juggermaw wasn't available, theoretically they might have been able to repeat that game one performance. But I think some players, they're going to have rosy memories of that excellent game one where they annihilated Snake. And the next one... Some other players, though, the nightmares of the Juggermore. Yeah, and Crystal's going to give Death a couple of nightmares there, but a great split between EDG and OMG. Those are the two best teams in the league. You want more? The third best team is coming up as well. OMG are going to take on Star Hunt Royal Club after this quick break.